let us have a look at this board that we have in our lab. What you see in this picture is a programmable logic controller which is connected to a number of actuators and sensors. First of all, let us see the actuators. Here what you see is a double acting pneumatic cylinder which is controlled by a 5 by 2 directional control valve. So I'll, I'll just take a break. Let me attach a mouse to it. So as I said that this is a programmable logic controller that you are seeing. Then we have a double acting cylinder, pneumatic cylinder, which is controlled by this 5 by 2 directional control valve. Now this 5 by 2 directional control valve has two solenoids. In the animation that we saw, there was only one solenoid. So when we were operating the solenoid, the spool moved in to one position and when the solenoid was switched off, the spring pushed the spool to the other position. Here we have two solenoids, so there is no spring inside the spool. So for one position we operate this solenoid, for second position we operate this solenoid. We will also see the close up of these pictures. Now for this pneumatic cylinder, because the piston will be either fully extended or fully retracted, so to sense the two position we have two proximity sensors. These two are capacitive type proximity sensors. Now this sensor is connected to input port number one of the PLC here, somewhere here. The second one is connected to input port number 2 of the PLC. The solenoids are the outputs. So they are connected to the PLC on the output side. So you will see them when we take a have a close up view of the PLC. Similarly, this is a single acting pneumatic actuator controlled by a 3 by 2 solenoid wall having one solenoid again two proximity sensors then this is an AC induction motor uh, sorry synchronous motor which can rotate in clockwise and anti-clockwise direction similarly this is also an identical AC synchronous motor which can rotate in clockwise and anti-clockwise direction These are some more, uh, these are proximity sensors and these are limit switches. So on this board, we have a total of 11 sensors, number 1, number 2, number 3, number 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11 and we have a total of 7 outputs, output number 1, output number 2, output number 3, then output number 4 for clockwise and output number 5 for anti-clockwise. Similarly output number 6 for clockwise and output number 7 for anti-clockwise. Now this is a close up of the PLC. So on this what you see is that there is a display then there are 
uh, five buttons here for programming. Now on this side what you see is screw terminals for the input and on this side we have screw terminals for the output. Now these screw terminals are covered by this connector. This connector basically connects this wire to the serial port of the computer so that we can make the PL uh, letter diagram in the computer and transfer it to the PLC. All these wires are of the sensors and the wires on this side are of the outputs. You may be able to see there are number beads on the wires which indicate that okay which wire is coming from which sensor. And this PLC is an ABB make PLC as you can see from here. Now this is a close up view of the single acting pneumatic actuator. So here you can see that we are controlling this actuator with this wall. Now physically this is a 5 by 2 wall because there is a pressure port. This is the pressure port. This tube is coming from the compressor. Working port 1 connected to the cylinder. Working port 2 which is blocked by a plug. There is one exhaust port and there is second exhaust port. But we are using it as a 3 by 2 reason being that this working port and this exhaust port are not being used. So we are basically using the pressure port, this working port and this exhaust port. Now this has a single solenoid and it also has a spring inside like similar to the one you saw in the uh, animation. Now when the solenoid is not energized. The spool position is such that the working port is connected to the exhaust port and the pressure port is blocked. Whereas when the spool, this solenoid is energized, it moves the spool in such a way that this exhaust port is blocked and the pressure port is connected to working port that is then the piston will extend. Now the retracted position and the extended position are sensed by this sensor and this sensor respectively. This is connected to input number 3 of the PLC and this is connected to input number 4 of the PLC. This is the output number 3 of the PLC. So just remember input number 3 input number 4 and output number 3. Why? Because you will shortly see a video. Now before we see a video, what you see on the screen is a program right? of a PLC. It's a one line program. We will be doing this programming in detail tomorrow and programming is quite easier and in one day only you will be able to grasp the fundamental of the letter programming. So what you see in this diagram is two vertical lines and one horizontal line. Horizontal line has I4 symbol here and Q3 symbol here. Now it is 4 and I means input. Input 4 is now we are referring to the this sensor input 4 and Q3 is referring to this coil. So what we are saying in this program is that when input number 4 senses something or input number 4 is closed then output number 3 should be switched on. So let's see the video. So what you will see in the video is, let me move the video a little bit.
so what you will see in the video is that when an object is brought in front of this proximity sensor the piston will move forward as long as the object is here the piston will remain extended but when the object is removed the piston will move back that is so because in the program we have said that when input number 4 is closed closed means it is working then output number 3 should be switched on so when an object in front comes in front of this sensor the sensor will give a signal to the plc the plc will then start this solenoid due to which the pressurized air will flow into the cylinder and the piston will move forward and all sensors normally have a visual indicator kind of leds attached to them so i hope that when this sensor works when the pen will be brought in front of it you should be able to see an led glowing here now i will start the video so now if we see that here we have made a small automation that when a sensor detects an object the actuator works this kind of scenario is encountered on kind of some uh, normally conveyors that as conveyors are moving on which the components are moving when the component reaches a particular location where the sensor is mounted a pneumatic cylinder will normally eject it and push the component into a bin or into a lorry or something now uh, we will not discuss programming here but i'll just want to show you some more videos although we will uh, see them tomorrow but uh, here Now this is a close-up view of the double-acting pneumatic actuator. Right. Now this is input number one. This is input number two. This is the directional control valve for this actuator, and this is the solenoid that is output number one, and second solenoid output number two. so if you look at a program what you see is that now this program has two lines in the first line we are saying that when i1 is closed <coughs> q1 should be switched on and when i2 is closed q2 should be switched on so looking at the system now you can see when the piston is in this position i1 will be closed that means then we are asking the controller to start q1 when that happens pressurized air will flow to this side and the piston will move forward now when the piston moves forward this will st stop sending signal this will become open and when this reaches here this will start sending signal to the controller that is i2 will be closed when i2 is closed then as per the program the controller will switch on q2 when that happens pressurized air will flow on this side and then the piston will move backward so when the piston moves backward again this will switch on so what will happen the cylinder will keep on reciprocating so let us see the video of this so because of this program the cylinder will simply keep on reciprocating between the two extremes so so what we see is that uh, solenoids which are electrical systems 
they are actually moving making the spool move inside the uh, directional control valve due to which the air flow is occurring in different directions so electrical systems have a very important role to play as actuators in automation systems second thing is the plc which is an electronic component so now it is the plc in whose memory the program is running and based on the program and the signal that it receives from the sensors it is actuating the electrical outputs now another question was that how timing can be done in dc walls so as i said that we will discuss that in detail also but today now let us see uh, another system now here this is the same system for which we saw the video right now a double acting actuator controlled by 5 by 2 directional control valve having reciprocating motion but right now we are introducing a time delay look at this diagram and if you recollect the first line is same as in the previous program input i will result in switching on q1 second line i2 <coughs> now here instead of q2 we have a timer and in the third line the timer is now activating q2 so what we have done we have inserted a timer between i2 and q2 so what will be the effect that when the piston is uh, retracted i1 is closed immediately q1 will be switched on and the piston will move forward so when the piston moves forward i2 will be closed but then what will happen that event will trigger a timer the timer in the timer we have set some time maybe 5 seconds 10 seconds so only after that time has elapsed then only q2 will be switched off so let us see the video <coughs> so what we just saw was that incorporating a time delay in a, in a, in operating a cylinder now there is a very important point to be noticed here in our previous example the piston was reciprocating continuously whereas in this example the piston is reciprocating but there is a time lag when it starts the backward journey now we have made changes to the behavior of the system or to the functionality of the system by simply changing the program right so when we have a controller then we have a flexible automation or a flexible system whose functionality can be changed by simply changing the program we need not make changes to the hardware circuit this thing will discuss in the afternoon session that we'll elaborate on this now another feature which i will demonstrate just right now is long with the time delay counting because i said on a previous occasion that timers and counters are two very important components of automation as well as of plc's 
again our system is same the same double acting cylinder the same directional control wall same sensors same coils but now the program has been further changed we have i1 input sensor number 1 and q1 coil number 1 now we also have a another component in the circuit which is basically a counter then we have i2 i2 we are using to start the timer as well as to increment the counter the last line remains same the timer is actuating q2 now let us see the video so here what you will see is that the piston will extend for a limited number of times then it will come to a halt so now the video is still running but as you can see the piston has now stopped the reason being that a count value of 5 was given in this program to the controller so that after making five strokes the piston should stop so this was a brief introduction about automation the second major component of this course is robotics so we will now have a brief introduction to robots so again i may not go through all the slides of this uh, ppt because it's an introductory introductory session now talking of robots first of all a very briefly historical perspective the word robot was first used in 1921 by a czechoslovakian <coughs> playwright karel kapek he wrote a satirical drama kind of a comedy rosam's universal robots in this robo in this uh, drama the robots word was used for slave or you can say forced labor the word robota was derived from the czechoslovakian language which means slaves or forced laborers then the term robotics was coined by an american author and professor of biochemistry at boston university isaac asimov in his short story titled run around so here you can see that both the terms robot as well as robotics were coined not by engineers but by uh, literature literary people now what we see here is a robot manipulator so uh, as we can see we may state that industrial robot is a mechanical manipulator that can be programmed to perform a variety of tasks so in this definition it's not definition basically it's a statement there are two important things one is a mechanical manipulator and second is which can be programmed now this is also a mechanical manipulator this is also powered but this is not programmable so here this manipulator is moved by using joysticks which the operator can move to move the manipulator so if we come to the exact definitions of robots there are two definitions one is a definition from a dictionary webster dictionary an automatic apparatus or device that performs functions ordinarily ascribed to humans or operates with what appears to be almost human intelligence the second definition is more technical given by robotic institute of america 
it says a robot is a reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator designed to move materials parts tools or specialized devices through variable program motions for the performance of a variety of tasks so robot configurations and kinematics will be discussed in detail but let us quickly go through there are mainly four robot configurations cartesian cylindrical spherical and articulated now in all these four you can see we are talking of three degrees of freedom in the first one all three degrees of freedom are linear and right angle to each other in cylindrical two two degrees of freedom are linear and one is rotational in spherical one is linear and two are rotational and in articulated all three are rotational so normally a manipulator will have 3 degrees of freedom in addition the tool that is attached to the wrist will have additional degrees of freedom so what we see here is a cartesian robot so as you can see it's an industrial robot whose three principal axes of control are linear and are at right angles to each other a popular application of this type of robot is a computer numerical control machine so cnc itself is kind of a uh, cartesian robot otherwise cartesian robots are also very popular for uh, placing things in and out of automated storage and retrieval systems then second is cylindrical robot so here you can see there is one rotational degree of freedom and there are two linear degrees of freedom so a horizontal arm is mounted on a vertical column and this column is then mounted on a rotating base the horizontal arm can slide vertically on the columns so we can see a video of this also you can see a linear motion second linear motion and then the rotational motion so here you can see that for the motors are being used for all type of motions for linear motion lead screw mechanism is being used and rotational is directly achieved through the rotation of the motor again right now the next one is a spherical robot also called a polar robot so here as you see in the diagram there are two degrees of ro uh, rotational motions and one linear so a horizontal arm is mounted on a rotating base the arm can also move through certain angle with base as the pivot the horizontal arm can slide horizontally so if we see the video of it you can see there are rotate again second rotational motion and a linear motion then before we come to the last one that is the fully articulated there is another configuration which is although it is intermediate between these but it is given special importance because of its uh, usefulness 
इट इज कॉल्ड स्कारा और सेलेक्टिव कंप्लायंट असेंबली रोबोट आर्म और सेलेक्टिव कंप्लायंट आर्टिकुलेटेड रोबोट आर्म सो इन द फिगर एज यू कैन सी देर आर टू रोटेशनल मोशन एंड देयर इज वन लीनियर मोशन but these are slightly different as compared to what you saw earlier right here both the rotational motions are in one plane only there they were in, in the earlier one the two rotational motions were in two perpendicular planes so the arm is compliant in the xy direction but rigid in the z direction hence the term selective compliant the jointed two link arm layout is similar to human arms hence the term articulated and this feature allows the arm to extend into confined areas and then retract or fold up let us see a video of it let me play it by some other means so this show you the video uh, by opening it by some other means so this is the video of a skara robot as you can see that two rotational dofs are in the same plane so what you just saw that during this video this robot it transferred 168 parts in 40.99 seconds that is 0.244 seconds per part uh and if we go slightly back in this video so you can just see that on this pellet there were a holes the speed as well as the accuracy because it was lifting the steel balls and placing them in different depressions there were not holes there were depressions made in this so the speed and accuracy is marvelous okay we go back to our presentation now the last configuration of this uh, in robotics is articulated robots so as you can see in the diagram all the three degrees of freedom are rotational 
बेस शोल्डर एंड एल्बो राइट ऑल दीज थ्री आर रोटेशनल टाइप सो एन आर्टिकुलेटेड रोबोट कंसिस्ट ऑफ टू शोल्डर ज्वाइंट टू शोल्डर ज्वाइंट मीन्स बिकॉज दिस बेस and this both these joints are considered as shoulder joints <coughs> one elbow joint and two or three wrist joints so these are the most common type of robots so we can have a industrial robot with various this. axis configurations however the vast majority of articulated robots feature six axes also called six degrees of freedom six axis robots allow for greater flexibility and can perform a wider variety of applications than robots with fewer axes Axis one. This axis, located at the robot base, allows the robot to rotate from left to right. This sweeping motion extends the work area to include the area to either side and behind the arm. This axis allows the robot to spin up to a full 180 degree range from the center point. Axis two. This axis allows the lower arm of the robot to extend forward and backward. It is the axis powering the movement of the entire lower arm. Axis three. The axis extends the robot's vertical reach. It allows the upper arm to raise and lower. On some articulated models, it allows the upper arm to reach behind the body. further expanding the work envelope this axis gives the upper arm the better part accessibility axis 4 working in conjunction with the axis 5 this axis aids in the positioning of the end effector and manipulation of the part known as the wrist roll it rotates the upper arm in a circular motion moving parts between horizontal to vertical orientations Axis 5. This axis allows the wrist of the robot arm to tilt up and down. This axis is responsible for the pitch and yaw motion. The pitch or bend motion is up and down, much like opening and closing a box lid. Yaw moves left and right like a door on hinges. Axis six. This is the wrist of the robot arm. It is responsible for a twisting motion, allowing it to rotate freely in a circular motion, both to position end effectors and to manipulate parts. It is usually capable of more than a 360 degree rotation in either a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. The most popular six-axis robots are manufactured by Motoman, Fanuc, Panasonic. ADD and Nachi. To purchase a six-axis robot, contact Robot Works. Okay. So these are the typical configurations of robots. Now, just like any automation system, a robot also has basic components. So the most basic is the manipulator. That is the mechanical linkage, which actually does the work. so manipulator is series of rigid members called links connected by joints then we have actuators which will move this manipulator by moving the individual joints and links so actuators provide power to the manipulator and then we have sensory devices which will monitor position speed acceleration torque etc controller which will provide the intelligence to make the manipulator perform in a certain manner and then drive circuits or power conversion units 
which will take signal from the controller and convert it into meaningful power level so that actuators can move. So what you see here is photograph of a robot in our laboratory. So this robot is a uh, fully articulated 5 degree of freedom robot. So along with the robot what you see is a teach pendant. We can control the robot by using the teach, pe teach pendant. Then this is the controller of the robot and the computer system in which the robot software can be run. The, as you can see here, what you see here is the motors. So these all are motors which basically make the joints and the links to move in space. So when we give the command, when the this controller gives the command to the motors to move <coughs> at a certain speed through a certain angle, the motors will do so. The motors are provided with feedback systems through uh, and optical encoders. The encoders will then provide the feedback to the controller that the motor has moved through this much angle and at this much speed. The teach pendant can be used to uh, manually move the robot or even to run programs which are previously made. Now this particular robot is a scorebot robot uh, provided by a company named Intellitech and these are the, in this figure you see the links and joints. So what you see in this figure are the links, base, body, then upper arm which is a link, forearm which is a link and then the joints, the base joint, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint and for the wrist, pitch and roll. Now in this particular robot all the motors are mounted here at the base so this is a close up view so here you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 motors along with timing belts and pulley arrangements for operating different joints. Now all these motors are DC servo motors. So these motors they have the motor as a, an encoder on one end to provide feedback of speed and position to the controller. Then there is a gear drive on the other end and then these connectors that you see these are for the power and these are for the encoder. Now as I said that along with the encoder there are cams and micro switches which are attached. We will discuss them in detail when we discuss robotics. So let us for the time being we will skip them for the time being. Uh, this also we will discuss in our session on robotics. Now uh, just a very brief introduction to a robot programming which will be basically we will see a video that how a robot works when program. Now let us see a robot program. Now this video is about a pick and place operation. The requirements are that a robot has to pick an object from one location and place it on another. Then another object will uh, come at the initial location, the, object, the robot will move back, again pick the second object and place it at the target position. It's a cyclic operation, so which the robot will perform. Now for this, what are the requirements? One is that we must be able to tell the robot the positions from where the objects are to be picked and where the objects are to be placed. Now these are the minimum two positions. Otherwise, when a robot moves to pick an object, it first moves 
it should first move close to the object which is to be picked then there normally the robot will open its gripper and then move to the exact position where it can grasp the object similarly after grasping the object the robot must move slightly vertically up so that the object is clear of the surface on which the object was placed and then the arm will move through the space go to a position so that the object is as close to the surface where it is to be placed as possible and then it should release the object very carefully so a number of positions have to be first recorded and then they are put in the program and the recording is done manually the robot is moved manually through teach pendant and the positions are recorded and then we must decide the speeds at which robot must move so after recording positions and deciding the speeds program is coded using relevant commands <coughs> then the program is executed resulting in the robot performing required operations so today we'll just see the video this we will do later on now the video that you will see it is for this robot and you can go through the program this is the complete program so we have recorded some positions which have been numbered as 1 2 3 4 5 etc and as you can see in the first statement go to position 1 speed 5 that means we are instructing the robot to go to position 1 <coughs> with a speed code of 5 now 5 here means a medium speed then in the second command we are asking the robot to open the gripper third command we are asking the robot to go to position 2 with speed 1 that is at a lower speed then wait for uh, 3 seconds wait 30 bus, uh, 30 is basically here it's the unit is 1 tenth of a second then close the gripper then go to position 1 and then all the commands as you will see are basically to go to different positions at different speeds waiting opening gripper or closing gripper so you will see the execution of these commands in the video so this is position 1 and this is position 5 uh, sorry this is position 2 I'm sorry this is 5 so this is position 1 open gripper position 2 close gripper move back to position 1 then go to position 3 then position 4 and then release the object so here we are placing the same object back to its original location so that it can perform the operation in cycles So uh, that was all about the introductory session on automation and robotics. So now I will invite questions, any queries from the centers and from the participants in the studio. So first we can go to the centers one by one and ask if there is any query.
This is, I think, okay. This is Gyan Jyoti. This is Usharpur. This is Gyan Jyoti. Right. Okay, Gyan Jyoti. If there is any query, we have just gone through a introductory session on robotics and automation. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Doctor Neeraj. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, so I have one question. Uh, uh, how the motion or uh, how the speed is decided on, based upon the inertia? Speed of a robot is decided on, based upon inertia. Distance is uh, uh, one thing. I have uh, one query related to inertia. How it is decided based on inertia? Speed, that is. You see, basically, uh, because here we are talking of control, because when we are going to position the rest of the robot at a particular location, the first thing is that a robot arm has its own mass, hence inertia, its own damping and stiffness. So the uh, for deciding the speeds, uh, what is also called as uh, trajectory planning where the path and the speed everything has to be decided so modeling is required so for a very uh, accurate application we need to have a model of a robot so we can do the modeling and accordingly decide what should be the speed because if we from mechanical point of view if we uh, talk of a equation relating the inertia, damping and stiffness of a system to the force input, then we know that there we can have under damped system, over damped system, critically damped systems. So accordingly, overall a model of the system is re of the robot is required, the load it has to carry, the model of that load is required because the load may be fixed, for example a very simple load, like in this video you saw it is only picking up a very small block. But this load can be a difficult load also. For example, a ladle containing molten metal. Right? So there again, because it's a liquid, so more uh, complexity comes into play. So essentially I will say we need to have a very good model of the system based on which we can decide that, okay, what should be the speed. Right, sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Punjab University Regional Center, Sharpur. Any query? Yes, Dr. Sir, Boli. No, sir, thank you. I just oh. came up, came up here to unmute the button. Okay. So that feel like we are also responding. Okay, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next center. Now, uh, Gandhi Academy of Technology and Engineering. I think, sir, your mic is mute. Please. Sir, your mic is mute. We cannot listen to you. Hello. Now it is okay. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, when programming uh, an object, the object ka jo weight hai na, weight we have to um, fit in the program. Yeah, the weight of the object is. The object the ka jo weight hai. Yes. Weight lift karne ke liye jo robot ko we have to fit the um, program. Variable weight hai na, weight mana uh, five kg or ten kg, fifteen kg. Different types of load object hai, weight ka object hai. So we have to lift. So we have to feed the program to replace the uh, different types of weight. Yes. Uh, well, uh, there are two things. Uh, as I, there was a similar question from another center regarding inertia that basically is concerned with the mass and that's basically concerned with the weight. 
So as I said that for deciding the accurate speeds and accurate positioning, we need a model of the system. So through modeling, we can decide okay what speed should we keep so that we can achieve required accuracy and uh, positioning, accuracy in positioning. Uh, so is your question the same about that or something else? Because uh, uh, your uh, yeah, the voice was not very clear that if I, I was able to understand that your question was about weight that the robot has to carry. So that's weight, weight. Yeah, weight. That's what my answer is that based upon the weight, we have to decide the speeds. Right. So for that, we need a modeling. Thank you, sir. Okay, welcome. Now from Tamil Nadu. Any question? Sensor or any other uh, image processing or something? Uh, so please you can ask some question if you have. Sir, how the object can be detected, sir? How the? Object, what object you want to pick up. So okay. how? You see, in this uh, video we did not uh, talk about uh, detecting the object. Otherwise, objects can be detected by various ways. We can have proximity sensors or there may be a weight sensor on the platform on when the object is being kept or object can also be detected through cameras and image processing objects shape objects color objects orientation everything can be detected through uh, image processing by capturing the visual through a camera and then processing the image so that can be done yes sir Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 